for The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Our guest tonight is Lindsay Younts, and uh, there's a important reason why we scheduled her appearance here on The Journey Home at this particular time. Lindsay is a convert to the Catholic Church from an evangelical Quaker background, but the main reason that we wanted to make sure she was able to appear on The Journey Home during this August is because Lindsay is the actress that plays St. Therese mm -hmm. in the upcoming movie, Therese. And so we wanted to make sure that we had another opportunity to hear her story and how even the, the playing the part in the movie had a big part in her conversion, but also it would give another reminder for you to be praying for the movie, to do whatever you can to make sure that the movie is able to be shown in your area. And maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that during tonight's program. Now, the Journey Home is a live program, and your phone calls and emails are an essential part of this program. So right off the bat, let me give you the phone numbers. It's 1-800-221-9460. Or if you're outside North America, you can give us a call at 205-271-2980. You can send me an email at journeyhome, one word, at EWTN.com. Lindsay, welcome to the Journey Home program. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. It's great to have you here. And I'm trying to think back. We've finished seven years of these programs, and I think you're the first Quaker convert we may have had of hey, all, all, right. all the converts. So that's exciting. Bring in. <laughs> and my guess is that a fair number of our viewers, uh, though they've heard of the Quaker Church, don't know a lot about it. So we'll probably have you talk a little bit about that in a little bit. But uh, we're also going to make sure the audience knows that we're going to show some uh, clips from the movie. So you're going to want to make sure you don't step away for that uh, donut uh, <laughs> for very long because uh, we're going to be showing the clips a little bit later. But as I always do, I want to begin by asking you to give us a, a snapshot of your early spiritual journey. Sure. Well, I was raised in a Christian home. My parents are very devoted Christians. Um, and like you said, I was raised in a Quaker background, yeah. which is uh, basically evangelical Protestant, another, another form of that. Yep. There are lots of different kinds of Quaker churches, but the one I was involved in was um, generally evangelical. Um, and a lot of the, the basics that I learned um, were prayer. They have a great understanding of prayer mm -hmm. and the meaning of prayer, um, a reverence and a fear of, of God but also with that fear comes a great respect and love of God. Um, my parents always taught me to seek God's will in my life, mm -hmm. which then later played in my conversion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they taught me the importance of sacrificing things uh, to follow His will. Um, they also taught me how to um, give up the little things to God, such as my soccer games <laughs> or little tests. I was a real worry wart as a kid. I still am, but um, so they would tell me, you know, pray before your social studies test or, you know, give it to God. He'll help you. And they were always really wonderful about that, which definitely built that foundation for me as I've grown older and I have to pass that on to my kids as well. Um, and uh, it wasn't just my immediate family either. It was my extended family. Um, we're also very, very strong. Um, always praying together, reading scripture together. One part of the, my Quaker upbringing was studying scripture really intensely. We did things like Bible quizzing. We would pick one book out of the New Testament or um, one of the Gospels or the letters, and we would just study it really intensely, memorize scripture, and then um, have competitions on who could memorize the most <laughs> and things like that. Um, we always had Bible, Bible school. Bible sword drills, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and that of course also had an effect on my later yeah. um, coming into the church. Build a good foundation for all the faith that you, you right. have now. Right, right. Um, you did mention that, um, uh, that there isn't one Quaker church, right? I mean, when you say evangelical, that's, right. it's an interesting slant because when I think of Quakerism, I think of groups sitting in a circle and kind of being quiet until somebody hears the <laughs> spirit move. Yeah, that, and that is Quakerism at its core. Yeah. Um, the original Quakers, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to get away from the formal, ritual, um, liturgical type of worship. And so they would all come and meet for 
however long, hours sometimes, yep. wait for the Spirit to move, as you said, and then they would speak, share scripture, share a song, something like that. Um, very, very simple people. Um, and, and as the years have gone on, they've, they've branched out and changed a bit. And so the church that I was, um, that I was raised in, there was a, a, certainly a part of that. We did have a quiet time, it's called, or prayer time, but there was also um, a pastor, which in traditional Quakers, there weren't really pastors. There was pastors. a real authority. It was kind of the authority of the Spirit who right. might speak for an individual. Exactly. And so in the, in the more modern Quaker church, there is, there is a pastor, there is a sermon, the, the service is kind of centered around the sermon, and there's worship music and prayer time, and something you'd see in a traditional evangelical church. Because I'm thinking, I may be wrong in this, uh, but there was a book by Richard Foster mm -hmm. called Celebration and Discipline. Oh yeah, I read that in college. Right, oh, but yeah. I think he came from the Quaker, yes. this evangelical Quaker. Yes, he did. Yes, okay, because I was thinking he was from that movement of more of an evangelical Quakerism, but what was interesting is that, which I found about this book, which is very fascinating when you think about it, he was rediscovering these great Catholic spiritualities that were new in a way for the Quakers, mm -hmm. but in reality had always been there for Catholics. But in a way, he was discovering the discipline of fasting and, and all these things. At the same time that, sadly, there were Catholics that were becoming uh, less active in mm -hmm. these things. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like a, uh, the need to rediscover these things. Right, and you bring up an interesting point in that because a lot of people say like, oh, Catholic, what a big jump. And in some ways it was because Quakers don't have, don't, don't practice any of the sacraments in the way that Catholics understand them. I wasn't baptized. I didn't ever receive communion, yeah. um, things like that. But um, when I walked into a Catholic church, I felt at home immediately because of the, the silence and yeah. the quiet reverence that's also in the Quaker church. Yeah. yeah, it's often one of the main things we think about Quakers. There's also social consciousness amongst Quakers. Yes. Commitment to peace, mm -hmm. right, and, uh, and, and the love, you know, the, the demonstration of the gospel in love is a very important part. Yeah. I mean, that's what I've often said that we can, it says in Vatican II that sometimes the Holy Spirit is able to work in the hearts of those outside the church in ways that has a hard time working in our hearts here in the church. And so whatever the Holy Spirit is in grace in the hearts of our separated brethren is for our spiritual renewal. Right, we it's, can learn from each other. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think the Quakers have that one strength that even other Protestants need to learn from the Quakers that commit right. to simplicity. So there you were, uh, a Quaker, evangelical, mm -hmm. uh, very committed. Um, uh, so what, uh, oh, how did a little Quaker girl <laughs> ever get interested <laughs> in the Catholic Church? Um, I had no, I was not at all disappointed with my Quaker upbringing. I had no desire for more or anything. I didn't feel like my faith was lacking at all. I was very fulfilled. Um, but what had happened in my, in, uh, my childhood was somewhere along the line I got the impression that Catholics weren't Christian. Mm -hmm. And I had heard all these strange things about Catholics like they worship Mary and the saints yeah. and they have these, you know, bones of other people lying around and, you know, <laughs> crazy things like that. Um, and then I I'm, I'm actually met a real Catholic in high school and we became friends and one, I, one day I sort of flippantly mentioned, you know, well Catholics aren't Christian, yada yada. And he looked at me and said, can you really look at my my life and say that I'm not a Christian. And I realized instantly mm -hmm. that I had this preconceived idea with no sort of basis or anything. And uh, so we started to talk a lot about where he was coming from and then that began this avalanche of uh, my conversion. We'll just start stage by stage here. So you, wh in what sense, uh, so you put a challenge to him and he put a challenge to you? Exactly. All right, talk a bit about that. What did you start digging into? Um, the first thing that we really got into was just scripture. He was going through his own journey and like sort of reversion into the church, yeah. deciding to become confirmed and, and what that meant for him. Yeah. And I was always asking him questions from scripture. Well, what does this scripture mean to you? Uh, specifically, ba we started with baptism mm -hmm. because Quakers don't baptize. I was, I had always... Which is interesting, they don't baptize at all. Do no, they? It's, yeah. the, it's the idea of where you don't need the physical um, you don't need the water yeah. because the Holy Spirit, the, God's power is enough, um, which is true, but I think that God gives us a gift by, because we are physical yeah. beings, He gives us that gift to experience the host is something 
that's tangible, yep. you know, that we can experience. The water is something tangible. Um, anyway, so we started with baptism. And I realized that I had all these, from studying scripture, all these um, rem uh, retorts that I always gave, and they weren't working because he would come back with something else and something else. Okay. And that's what started to get me to read more scripture and more intently and more thoroughly, I guess. All right. So this, this lasted all through high school? This is when I was 16 is when okay. it started. All right. And um, of course that changed my entire perspective on a lot of things. That started to be my main focus even outside of school and um, it was disturbing to me that I had thought this about uh, Catholics yeah. and that it wasn't true and that made me wonder what else isn't true? What else do I believe that um, is based on some kind of misconception. Um, and I started to really wonder too, okay, what are the Quakers about? Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to read about Quakerism. And, um, and I have to mention too that I, I started with prayer because I did not want to be misled. Yeah. And I, I prayed to the Lord, please don't let me be led by any false doctrines. This is such a scary thing. Uh -huh. And so I knew later on that because I had prayed that, I had to trust where He was taking me. So you, you, you've examined scripture with this Catholic, mm -hmm. this, this obviously Christian right. Catholic, right. Okay, which then in itself is a reminder to us Catholics that our life needs to demonstrate our faith. Yes. And you also then examine your Quaker backgrounds mm -hmm. uh, versus scripture versus... Versus scripture, I also read different Quaker books on okay. Quaker doctrine. I, I was asking my youth pastor and my pastor and my family all these questions and they kept pointing me to these books and but nev none of my questions were ever actually answered. All right. So what was your first introduction to the Catholic Church per se? I mean, did you read Catholic things? Did um, my first... Well, I was still very turned off to the Catholic Church. Okay. I didn't want to become Catholic. Right. Um, scary world right there. Yeah. Um, but I started praying at Catholic churches because they were open all day long. And that's where I had my first real experience um, where God really spoke to me and said, don't be afraid. Okay. Basically, what happened was I was praying in this church and there's a statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus there. And I didn't know what the Sacred Heart was, but at the time... It's not exactly a Quaker thing. No, yeah. no. Statues <laughs> of Mary and the saints intimidated me, and so I could, I could identify with this Jesus. And, um, and I was praying, and I heard within my heart Him say, I am here. And I heard that three times, and then um, I was pretty scared. But I, I, I walked out of that church feeling like, okay, Jesus, I know you're telling me that I shouldn't be afraid. And now I look back and realize he was saying so much more than that. His real <laughs> presence was there. You Did know, you hear I'm him here. saying that uh, the Catholic Church was right versus all these others? No, that's not what I heard at the time. I just heard, um, I am here too. Okay. That's how I interpreted it. So at it. least brought the Catholic Church up to the level of yes, all the like, rest. Yes, yeah, it was, okay, it's Christian. I can trust it. Okay. You're still not ready to become Catholic yet at this point, though. I mean, how, no, right? not in any way, so not in any way. Let's keep going here. Right. I mean, uh, uh, you know, does your family like the direction you're going? Do they know? They didn't, they had, at this point they didn't know. They knew I had questions, but I was still too afraid to really ask any real questions. Um, once I had exhausted scripture, I read the Bible front to back, yeah. and I wrote all over it. I made these little signs for baptism and the authority of the church and the Eucharist <laughs> and all these different things, like trying to find parallels, yeah. trying to figure it out. Um, and then once I had, I had read all through that, I still had all these questions. And um, I realized that, in my mind, historically, I'd never connected the Reformation with the New Testament. It always mm -hmm. been the Reformation, Quakers, now. Yeah. I had never thought about this big chunk of 1,500 mm -hmm. years. I just assumed that the church had fallen into apostasy and Martin Luther redeemed it. So um, I went and I bought a book of early church writings. And that is what hooked me really into realizing, oh my goodness, the Catholic Church might be the true church, and what does that mean for me? I remember I was um, reading uh, like St. Ignatius and St. Irenaeus and Justin the Martyr, and here they were, I mean, the, the, the best friends of Jesus Christ, the best friends of the apostles are yeah. writing about the Eucharist 
you know, the communion being the real body and blood of Christ, writing about um, water baptism for children and babies, writing about the mass in like the second century, first century. Yeah. And um, I, was, I was literally blown away and intimidated and frightened. I was so excited at the same time I was so scared. I thought, I, I want to be part of the church that Jesus' best friends built, that what he, people that were closest to him, how they interpreted his words. Mm -hmm. And um, as I was looking at, and that time I was studying other church doctrines and realizing this might be the Catholic Church. Um, mm -hmm. I need to put these pieces together. So you, uh, it's interesting, you read earlier fathers and, and you don't find Quakerism there and you find the Catholic no. Church which makes it more intimidating because it really sticks out more than the rest. This is about the time I think that uh, that the movie kind of comes into your life, right? Right, kind of. Let's talk yeah. about that. Let's okay. Uh, well, by this time, I had um, been going to Mass every day um, because I couldn't go on Sundays. Yeah. Um, and once my family realized that I was going to Mass, I think, I think they got scared because the church they, that they knew was not the church that I yeah. had grown to love. Yeah. And that's what I think we have to remember about um, people that don't right. like the Catholic Church is probably what they know, what they've experienced is mm -hmm. not a true representation of the church. Mm -hmm. And so to be patient with them and, and show them in love that I'm sorry that you had this experience with the Catholic Church, but let me show you what the church really is and the love and, and truth that the church is. Anyways, so um, this was starting to become a very sticky situation with my, with my family. Um, but one day when I was going to Mass, um, St. Therese's relics were at church, and I didn't know who <laughs> she was or what relics even were. And, um, but I went into the church anyways, even though I was kind of scared by the idea of relics. <laughs> and, but I'd heard somewhere that you received graces from blessing or from um, being blessed yeah. by relics. And so I went through, the, um, went through the line, blessed Therese's relics. And I remember walking out of the church and feeling different. And I still can't explain what that was, but I remember thinking, is this what it's like to receive grace? because I'd never felt that before. Yeah. And then I forgot about her. And then about four months later, I was doing a one-woman show in my hometown, and somebody in the audience said, you should get a hold of St. Luke Productions. They do um, Christian shows. I didn't, because I was busy. And, and then he got hold of me again and said, you gotta call them, because we're doing a film. And so I called them, and I got an audition. And I was thinking, Maybe I'll, you know, help out on the set and get someone's water, tie someone's shoes or something. Um, but then they cast me as the lead and, wow. and then I met How old were you when you got the lead? I was 18. Wow. I was 18. And by that time I wanted to become Catholic. I was ready to become Catholic, but I had to wait until I graduated to go through that process for my family's sake. And yeah. What, uh, in a moment we're going to see a clip. Before we go there, I just want to ask, uh, what part did playing the role of this holy saint have in your own conversion of heart as far as becoming Catholic? It's still having an effect on me, and I hope it does till I die. Um, mm. I was really won over and wooed by theology mm -hmm. because my upbringing was so based in, in scripture and, you know, know your faith, that I was, I was really brought to the church through her theology. Mm. But then Therese introduced me to her spirituality, and it was this... The story of a soul. It was the story of a soul. And it was through that that all of a sudden, literally pieces just started to come together. And um, there's never been a, a part, I, I've had lots of parts since then, and nothing has affected me like she has. All right. Well, we'll have more time maybe after the break for some other questions. I'll bring out some aspects of that because I want to make sure that we have time for the clips. The first clip that we're going to see is about um, when Teresa talk, Therese talks about wanting to join the convent. Tell, tell the audience what they'll see in this first clip. Right, well, in this clip, Therese is talking to her best, or her sister, Celine, who was her confidant, and she has to face the difficult um, part of her journey to tell her father that she needs to go to the convent, and by this time, her other sisters have already left for Carmel. So this is a scene where she and Celine talk about that. All right, let's watch this. Celine, 
What am I going to do? You're going to follow your heart. He'll think it's because of Pauline. But it's not, is it? Besides, he won't be alone. I'll stay with him. No need to worry. Now, there's some unique parallels in that scene <laughs> in your own journey, right? Yes. yes. Were they vivid to you at the time you were doing the part? Oh, yeah. In fact, that's the scene that I read for in my audition. <laughs> and um, I remember reading that scene and thinking, oh, my goodness, this is exactly what I feel like was happening in my life. I feel called to do something. And I know it's going to tear my family apart. It's going to devastate them. And I, that's the last thing I wanted. Um, but I had to make that decision. I know, just like Teresa said, I know Jesus is calling me now. I have to go now. <laughs> I felt the same way, even though I know it would hurt my family. I knew that something I had to do. W were you wondering whether they were also going to imply that you were doing this just because of the influence of others? Yes, I thought, thought well, my Catholic friend had all this influence on me, or you know, just because the experience I had had, oh, definitely, or because I was doing the film. Yeah. I, I struggled with all of that, okay. certainly. So Celine's advice was the same advice to you. Yes, it was. Follow your heart. All right, same what about the next clip we're going to see? Um, this next clip is when Therese appeals to the Holy Father if she can enter Carmel at the age of 15, because at that time that was, it still is unheard of to enter the convent so young. Okay, so we're going to see two clips together. Right. One is her visit to the Holy Father. Right, and the next is her receiving the letter from the bishop that yes, in fact, she can enter Carmel, but she still has to wait. Okay, let's see the clip. Then. Most Holy Father, I have a great favor to ask of you. In honor of your jubilee, permit me to enter Carmel at the age of 15. I don't think I understand. Holy Father, this is a, this is a child who wants to enter Carmel at the age of 15. The superiors are considering the matter at the moment. Do what the superiors tell you. Holy Father, if you say yes, everyone will agree. Mademoiselle Martin, that is quite enough. There, there. You will enter, if God wills it. Now, there's also something special in this the cast of this scene, right, that's unique <laughs> to your own journey, is that correct? Right, the man who played the Holy Father, Bishop Meeking, um, almost a year later it was the one who baptized me and gave me my first communion and confirmed me in the church, so. <laughs> Did he know that was in the process at the time you were doing No, that? no, it was a total coincidence. <laughs> it was really cool. All right, now, this third clip is about, this is where you re uh, Tr St. Therese receives the letter. Right, she's been waiting to find out if she can enter Carmel, and finally she receives the letter. Okay, let's see this clip. Do 
Dear Mademoiselle Montan, I am happy to inform you that after meeting with the Superior of Carmel, I have decided to permit you to enter the Lycée of Carmel at the unusual young age of 15. <laughs> However, because of the extraordinary circumstances of your situation, your entrance is to be delayed for three months until after Lent of this year. All right. Um, and you had to wait too, right? I had to wait too. Finally, when I knew Jesus helped me realize I needed to become Catholic, I had to wait another year. But that's in how he, how he works. All right. Well, let's take a break and we'll come back a little bit and as we go to the break you're going to see the trailer for the movie to give you a little bit more of a taste of this wonderful movie that hopefully will be in your area and probably later in the in the show we'll talk about what we can do to to uh, do all we can to make sure that the movie is available for you so let's watch the trailer and we'll be back in just a bit the day of mama's death i didn't cry and i didn't speak to anyone about my feelings What's wrong, Trez? <laughs> Please heal my little one. I have to fly away. You're awfully young to be making such a serious decision. Father, if you say yes, everyone will agree. Mademoiselle Martin, that is quite enough. I want to be a saint, but I feel so helpless. The closer you approach to God, the simpler you will become. to carry out the most heroic deeds for you. Get to work. Like this. Every time I look at you, I see you smile. Yes. Sister. Welcome back. Our guest tonight is Lindsay Younce, the uh, actress who played St. Therese in the wonderful movie Therese. And uh, I'm going to say right off the bat that if you are interested in finding information about the movie, the website is Therese Movie, T-H-E-R-E-S-E -E Movie, one word, TherezeMovie.com. If you go to that site, you can find out about the movie and also on how you can, I think they're still looking for signatures, right? Is, or is that? Yeah, they are. Okay. You can still sign on and so there's a little square at the top that says bring to rest to your area or something like that and you can petition online. Because the issue is getting a major film distributing house to distribute the movie, right? Is it's right, as I understand it, yeah. Okay, all right, let's keep it in prayer and do all we can to make sure that it uh, comes to your area. In fact, let's go with this first email. This comes from Mark in Egan, Minnesota. Peace be to you. I can't wait until Therese is released. I hope it comes to us here in Minnesota. I feel this film will touch many souls. My question is, how has your prayer life changed since becoming Catholic? Thank you, Mark, for your fine email. Wow, that is a really good question, um, Mark. <laughs> um, I would have to say that my prayer life has become more contemplative, definitely. Um, 
I think I've learned, we have a great gift from the Blessed Sacrament that I think often um, some Catholics don't realize that they have. Um, to have Jesus physically present with you. Um, and that's increased um, my prayer life a lot. Just that peace um, that I have when I'm present with Him. Also, I think there's a, I learned a lot about how, what it's like to just be quiet with God and not have to say anything. Like Therese talked about, just resting with Him even if you fall asleep. Just having that time um, with your best friend, with your love, Jesus. Mm. That is interesting to think about your Quaker background connected with the simplicity of St. Therese. I mean, there's really a connection there, isn't there? Yeah, there is. I mean, that was her entire mission, was that you don't have to do anything great or be anything great um, to be yeah. a saint. And that's, yeah. Yeah. that's the gospel. That's one of her great messages. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take our first caller, Jeffrey from Maine. Hello, Jeffrey. What's your call for? Uh, yes. I. My call is for your guest, and I had a question. Yes. Uh, two of them, actually, very short. And the first one is, um, have you seen The Passion, the Mel Gibson play? And also, how? what would you suggest to young women entering the religious life, being someone who has played it on a movie, how would you sort of suggest to other young women who want to enter at such a young age? Like you go, girls. You go. Um, <laughs> the first question, have I seen The Passion? Yes, I have a few times. Um, what did I think of it? I loved it, and I think we need more movies like it. Um, I think it was a very intimate um, portrayal of Jesus. Um, for women entering the comet, like I said, um, Pray, 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 pray. And that's what Therese did. When she felt like she had a calling, she prayed. She sought guidance from spiritual directors, from priests, from her father, from her family, from her sisters, from the sisters at, the Carmo, at Carmel. Um, but I would say pray and follow that calling. And you may not have a calling to the religious life, um, but you also may. So pursue it. And if you run into trial, that's probably a good sign. That it's probably for you. I was joking with um, with Lindsay before that she and my wife Marilyn share things in common that both play nuns. Uh, my w <laughs> my <laughs> wife is playing a nun in the, our local community theater theater production of um, The Sound of Music, and so. But, but is there a chance in the playing of that nun that you got a flavor, a taste for it? I mean, it's so hard with the, with oh, the cameras yeah. and everybody around. Oh, yeah. Um, well, while I was in Eugene, when we, when we were filming most of the Carmelite scenes, I stayed at a Carmelite convent, um, and I got to see the sisters live, and and I there was a time when I really wanted to be a nun, and I think mm. a lot of it had to do with putting on the costume, sort of living the life. It's very romantic. Yeah. There's something very romantic about, you know, living for your love, Jesus, and marrying Jesus. Yeah. Which reminds me of the opening of Sound of Music, where exactly. there's Maria. Exactly. She's drawn into it for the romance of it, what she had seen over the wall and all of that. Right, and but is she really called to do it? Yeah, that was yeah. the question. Is she really called to do that, mm -hmm. or was she called to be a mother? And, uh, uh, but there's the testing of it, which was a part of Therese's right. you know, early part. Right. Was this really what God called her to do? And that's what the Holy Father said. If God calls you to do it, you will do it. Mm -hmm. Let's take the next, next email from Wendy. I'm hoping to start RCI this fall if schedules work out. I feel the pull strongly to marry, but I'm unsure if I can attend all the classes. Were there sticking points in the catechism for you? And how did you make peace with those points? She uses two question marks in there, so she's you know, on her journey. I am doing hospice for a mother in my home, so free time for classes is very limited, but such peace do I find there. Thank you, Wendy, for your, mm. for your email. So, you know, the question, oh, sticky places in the catechism on your journey? Um, yeah. Um, first of all, Wendy, I would say um, keep persevering. There was, I was going, I was from my freshman year of college when I was doing RCA and I didn't attend a lot of the classes, but I was able to work it out with the teacher that I met with her one-on-one -on -one, and so it is possible. If it's God's will, He will figure out a way for you to do it. Um, he wants you home. So, um, And as far as sticky points in the catechism, yes. 
all over the place. Mary was a huge stumbling block to me. The <laughs> saints were a huge stumbling block to me. And that's something that even after becoming Catholic, I've had to ask Jesus to help me with. And he has, he's been so faithful, especially in the last year, I've been able to understand Mary's role mm. in, in, in my life of prayer and in my life. She always points to him. She always points to him. I think that's the important thing to remember. Yeah, yeah, that really is the key point. Any of you out there, especially on the journey where Mary's still a, a, a hurdle, every aspect, every devotion to Mary, mm -hmm. every picture, it's all about her pointing to Jesus. Yes, follow my son, listen to my son, love my son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good point, thank you. Let's take our next caller, Mary Ann from Pennsylvania. Hello, Mary Ann, what's your question? Hi, I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We have a large network of friend schools here. Yeah, that's yes, right. And I worked at one for a few years. And my impression of Quakers was rather quite different than what you had said. To me, they seem to be more secular humanist, more into social activists rather than religion. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I they sort of, when you said anything about the crucifixion or the resurrection, they sort of like, well, we really don't believe in that. And my question is, do they believe uh, in the divinity of Jesus or that he is just a great teacher? Thank you very much. That's, That's a good point. It is a good question because, um, like I said before, a lot of there are a lot of different kinds of Quaker um, theologies or teachings, and I and I am aware of actually that sect of Quakerism. Um, but I think the important thing to remember is Quakerism in its um, where it began. It was very it was very Christian. It believed in the Trinity, the divinity of Jesus. Um, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, his reign over the earth, reign over heaven, all those things that, that do tie all of us Christians together. Yeah. So be encouraged that those Quakers that you know probably aren't and um, would disagree with other Quakers. So. Yeah, it, it, when the reformers, all the different reformers uh, began, they began with the same underlying assumptions of Christianity that we all right. that we all basically agree in. Luther was still a Catholic, very much at heart, all mm -hmm. his life. Um, had a devotion to Mary, so did John mm -hmm. Calvin. I mean, that was their assumption. It was as the next generation, the next generation, the next generation responded to that, brought up in a non-Catholic environment, didn't have the same assumptions that they kind of drifted. And I suppose that if we looked at Quakerism, you know, in its different branches, that, that really your branch of Quaker, of the Quaker church was a breakaway of right. a group that wanted to become more scriptural, more evangelical, breaking away from these other groups that mm -hmm. had, are really, sadly, in a lot of these Protestant groups, the longer they're around, the more liberal they get. That's the scary thing is that yeah. I think once you, once you believe that, oh, I can make my own decision about this, um, based on what I feel or what I think, based on nobody else, I mean, no yeah. other sort of basis except just scripture. When we, I think history has proven that there is no such thing as sola scriptura right. because there's thousands and thousands of different theologies out there. You need something like tradition to, I mean, obviously scripture is the holy word of God, no doubt about that, but you need something like tradition to hold that yeah. all together. And the authority of the church to discern right. which of the traditions that are out there uh, right. is the authentic one to interpret that scripture. Just like so, in a family, you need yeah. a father and a mother to have the final yeah. say. Very good, very good, Lindsay. Let's go with the uh, next email from Maria from Miami, Florida. Hey, Lindsay and Marcus, I'm a 16-year-old girl. Uh, Maria, thank you for writing, that's just great. Also wanting to convert to Catholicism. Maria, you're in our prayers. And I've been waiting for this movie to come out for two years. I know the trailer, clips, and soundtrack by heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to ask Lindsay why she thinks that this movie is important to teens and why the message in this movie is important to teenagers today. Thanks, Lindsay. You are so amazing. God bless you. Maria, thank you for your email. Maria, you are amazing. <laughs> you are amazing. Keep, keep trucking along on your journey. Um, this movie is very important to teens. The story is important to teens because 
Therese, just like you, Maria, at 16, Therese, at a young age, knew that God was calling her. And I think that that shows young people, showed myself, that God calls you no matter how old you are, and that you can have a devotion to God, a devotion to Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, at a very, very young age. And, um, and Therese's perseverance also shows that you need to keep praying and trust that. Also, the young adults, teens, we are the largest and I say we because I'm still a part of that <laughs> age group, we are the largest audience for films, and film is the largest form of media. And they, Hollywood, Hollywood or the media, will listen to us. If we go see movies like The Passion or Therese, they will, they will see that, oh, there's an audience, we better make films for these people to see. So you do have much more of a voice than you think you do. Yeah. I think Therese is a great saint for the young adult. Oh, yeah. I mean, just perfect. and. Uh, um, in fact, um, well, let's go, the, let's go to the phone call. This comes from Scott in California. Hello, Scott. What's your question? Hello. Um, thank you for taking my call. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Lindsay. I'm an actor, singer myself. Great. And I'm also a convert to Catholicism. Welcome home. And in this industry, which is very, huh. in many ways, anti-Catholic and anti-Christian, I am just um, really interested in how Lindsay is able to keep a very strong spiritual life um, in the midst of being surrounded in many ways by by forces that are working against that. Yeah. I find that in my own work that I'm dealing with a lot of people who are not believers or very anti-Catholic. And mm -hmm. so it's a big challenge for me, and I'm just I'm wondering how you do it, Lindsay. Scott, thank you for your call, and yeah. I'll tell you what, everybody's listening and is praying for you. God bless you in your work. We're glad you're there, mm -hmm. and uh, boy, we want to keep you it's, an, it's a difficult industry, isn't it? It is hard, and I, I gosh, just this last year I had this huge um, transformation where I really gave up on it. I thought, I can't do this. I just can't live this life like I want to live and, and, um, and be an actor. And then I, I realized if God has given you a desire in your heart, then he has a purpose for it. And, um, and I think that, I think what's so sad is that the reason I, I think the media or whatever is the way it is is because people have said, okay, I'll do that to be a part of this. And, and if we say, no, we won't. We have these morals. We have these values. Um, people will rise to that. People will rise to what you expect of them. And nothing is ever worth, your career is never worth losing um, your, your spirituality or your closeness to God. And I know it's really hard. I was just down in LA, and and I had this moment where I was I wanted to have my rosary with me, and I was doing these the, when I was working, and I and I had this moment of, well, I don't know that I want to have my rosary out, and then I thought, no, I can't think like that, and um, it's very very hard. And I think um, my spiritual director told me, and this is what keeps me focused, that your purpose is to love. You're not made to be a movie star. You're made to love, and if God wants you to do that then you got to do it through love. And so that's what's got to keep you focused. I was thinking, um, Lindsay, that in the, you read the writers like uh, St. Francis de Sales and, and mm -hmm. other Catholic spiritual writers, and they'll talk about our need to discern the voices. Mm -hmm. And often in, in older Catholic spirituality, that was often pictured like an angel on one shoulder and a, right. and a demon <laughs> on the other, okay? Uh -huh. But that was the idea that we're, we're torn between these voices. Well, the, again, Hollywood, I remember how many cartoons he saw as a kid, a Donald Duck cartoon, you know, where they would have this, the angel and the devil, and so it's belittling the reality of it. And so pretty soon we think it's a joke. Mm -hmm. That's not Is real. Is there really a good and an evil? There's no real. So the voices that are there, the temptation, it's belittled, you don't, it's not of the devil or of the angel, right. you know, and so y you become blind to those influences. And just like you said, Pretty soon, those who were paying for the movies, driven in the movies, or called to act in the movie. Right. Had, and that is a real down. calling. I mean, it's not like yeah. God doesn't call. Just like the Pope wrote that letter to artists, God has called us all to these all different callings. It's not just, you know, we are called yeah. to. We have to, we have to answer and say yes to that. And I think of the, the teaching of, of uh, Jose Maria Escriva in Opus Dei, where he calls us to seek our holiness where we are planted with the gifts we've been given. And if mm -hmm. your gifts and place to serve Him are in the theater, that's where you seek your holiness. Right. Is right there. You don't have to quit and become a nun unless that's what God calls you to be. 
but you play the best nun you can be, mm -hmm. if that's God called you to be in terms right. of your calling as an actress. Right. Let's take this next email. This comes from Harriet, OCDS, as the Lord Ooh. gives, lives before whom I stand, a quote from 3 Kings 18.1. And she asks, I'm beside myself with excitement about the movie. Lindsay, do you find St. Therese little way gratifying, difficult, or both? Mm. Do you know what those letters by her name mean? I do. I don't know what exactly what they mean, but I know Carmelite. Yes, yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> so she's like definitely excited. <laughs> she's excited about the movie because it's very much about the Carmelite. Oh, yeah. Life. Yeah. yeah. Um, we were, when we were in Rome, showing the Pope to the, showing the Pope, showing the movie to the Pope <laughs> in the Roman Curia. Um, I had that realization as, as I was watching it. Huh, I don't believe in the little way. And it struck me, I, do I really believe that I can become a saint? So I would say difficult in that way and gratifying. Um, in the last couple of years, I felt really convicted about that. You know, here I am playing Therese and representing her in some capacity, and yet do I really even believe in the little way? Um, I think it is so much harder than she describes it. Um, <laughs> but it is so gratifying, and it is the only way to holiness. It's the only way. I was thinking that uh, here we are doing this program on the Feast of St. Rose of Lima, who is known for talking about, reminding us about our need to suffer, mm -hmm. to accept suffering as the channel for grace. And with the little way, wouldn't you say that as soon as you say, I'm going to live the little way, that's like inviting suffering. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, it, yeah, it, it, it may sound that. simple on paper, but as soon as you say, I'm going to do it, then right. it really just comes And even Therese on. said it at her last hours, it is, it is easy to write beautiful things about suffering, but you don't know until you suffer. So even she knew it was hard. That's right. All right. Let's see if they're going to give us an email here in just a little bit. Um, maybe now. Why don't we take a break? And uh, We'll come back to submit with a couple final words for the journey home. See you in a bit. Lindsay and I were talking uh, during the break that one last question we ought to talk about is, you know, wh where is your family uh, now in relation with your journey? When you know we got an email from Harold in Maryland saying, Dear Marcus and Lindsay, what is your relationship with your family now that you are Catholic? Um, they did come to my baptism and my confir confirmation, and I think that took a lot of strength on their part. And it's been, it's been a rough ride. We have a lot of really good conversations about theology. We have a little, a lot of tense conversations about theology, but I think we're coming to, to a place where we um, understand and respect each other's differences in that way. And I think that they're learning a lot about the church through, through our example. And I think that I'm learning a lot about um, my own journey and about their journey through their example. And so I think it's a lot of give and take, but it's they're very loving, and they've. Um, and that always is what matters in the end. What do you think they're going to see when they see you as Therese? Um, they're such proud parents. <laughs> 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 they're probably just going to, yeah, beam. Yeah. They're very proud parents. So. All right. How has becoming a Catholic strengthened your faith in Christ? Um, Brought you closer to Jesus. Leaps and bounds, leaps and bounds. Because um, you were always close to him. Yeah, I was, and I always, and I always f wanted to be closer to him. Mm -hmm. But I think now, b being Catholic has helped me learn that I am imperfect, and that being imperfect is okay, mm -hmm. and that it's Jesus that takes me to heaven and not me, and um, and realizing that, that that that's a lifelong process, and realizing that that love is what life is about, and and that's what the incarnation was. 
-hmm. was God showing his love for us. And, you know, talking about the passion people, I had a friend ask me, like, well, where did it show how Jesus loved others and was helping others? And I thought, oh, gosh, the whole thing was about how he loved others. His entire crucifixion was an act of love. And that's what I've, the appreciation of that I've really learned. In the movie, in the little clips we've been able to see, we saw some clips when Patty DeFlippis was uh -huh. on the program. And there was that one where the one sister asked St. Therese, you know, why are you always smiling whenever you see me? And, and I thought about that. There you are playing the role of that, trying to feel uh, how she would have felt. But what was interesting is that she was being led by grace to really f feel right. different towards this person. It wasn't her. Yeah, she was letting Jesus in and saying, Jesus, help me to love her with your love. Help me to be merciful with your mercy because I can't do it on my own. And that's how she became a saint. Yeah. And I think to say, Therese, I can't be like you, is to completely do away with anything she ever wanted. She wanted us to say, I can't do it. Jesus, help me. Yeah. Be yeah. my sanctity. Completely. In the, in the simplest of things that God gives us to do in life, from peeling potatoes to right. uh, washing the clothes that we see in the in the scenes in the movie. And uh, well, first I'm gonna thank you so much for your portrayal in that movie, all right, and also your witness here. Thank you. And uh, our prayers are with you in the upcoming movie. I want to remind you again, Saint, it's called Therese Movie, TheresMovie.com, and find out more about the movie, what you can do to make sure that movie comes to your area. So Lindsay, thank you very much thank for you joining very much. God us bless here. You. Thank you very much for your witness. Our prayers are with you because you're going to continue in acting, right? I am as long as God wills it. Just married, right? Just married. <laughs> <laughs> so our prayers are with you. And uh, again, it's not an easy world, but it's a wonderful world. It's a, a tremendous way of witnessing your faith. Yeah. Um, I mean, in a sense, you, you received a bit of it from Leonardo and Patty DeFilippis as they modeled their faith to you during that production. Oh, yeah, I prayed every day on set And together. now you've got to pass that on to others, yeah. other actors and actresses. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us on The Journey Home. I hope you enjoyed this segment, and I hope you look forward, as I do, to the movie. And let's pray that uh, all the barriers are dropped so the movie will be able to see, be seen in your area. And let's also, but maybe more importantly, let's through the grace of Jesus try and imitate this wonderful saint who taught us to be simple in our love for Jesus and one another. God bless. See you again next week.